Hello and welcome to Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. Content marketing is the most powerful way of building an audience that will jump at the chance to buy your online programs and services. But what does the perfect business or personal type of content look like that can actually grow your online audience, let them know what you do without them feeling sold to? My guest, Lindsay Anderson, an expert in the field of content marketing, will share her secrets on how to create effortless content that builds your business without feeling like a used car salesman. Lindsay, it's so great to have you on the show. Oh, it's so great to be here. Thank you for having me on today. So let's talk, first of all, about content marketing versus traditional marketing, because that's a for some, a buzzword, content marketing, and for others, it's their entire business or industry. And uh, yeah, maybe if we can define what is and what isn't content marketing and where it fits into the overall marketing pie, that would be, I think, a great start to this. Yeah. So from my experience over the past 15 years being in the digital marketing space, I have found that marketing falls into one of four buckets. And so if we can go over these buckets and I would love to hear if you agree with that because you're you're an expert marketer as well. So the first, of course, is going to be search engine optimization, making sure that our website comes up for those specific keywords on Google and all the other search engines. Uh, that's one kind of marketing. Now, the pros and cons of that are uh, it's a long-term game. You can't just like go out there and expect a whole bunch of people to come to your website. Like you got to you gotta write blog posts. You got to care about keywords. And quite typically, you typically have to hire an agency to get some real results. And it's a long game, nine to 12 months to get some real results on search engine optimization. So the second kind of uh, marketing I have found is paid, paid advertising, Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, all of the ads. Now, that's a really great way of getting a running start, building momentum, and really exploding your coaching business or your online business, except for the problem is with the iOS update earlier in uh, March of 2021, Things got a lot more hairy and a lot more difficult for the regular old Joe to be running their ads on their very own because they got a lot more complicated. Uh, The third kind is going to be like affiliate and relationship marketing. Hey, you scratch my back, I'll give you 50 bucks or please send this out to your list or relationships. Hey, referrals of current clients. Um, that's a very powerful way of marketing. It's relationship marketing though. So you got to like make some relationships. You can't really fake it because, uh, people can see right through that and your, your affiliate and relationship marketing will not work. So that takes time and effort and a plan. So the fourth kind of marketing I think is going to be content marketing where we go out to YouTube, social media, all the places, and we give people a little bit of ourselves, a little bit of what we can offer, a little bit of aha moments. And if they can achieve an aha moment through our free content, then they will come to us for our additional products and services. So those are the four kinds of marketing that I see, and content marketing is the fourth and most powerful piece. Right. The godfather of content marketing, Joe Polizzi, was a guest on this podcast a while back. He's the founder of Content Marketing World and the Content Marketing Institute. So there seems to be some uh, confusion, I think, in the marketplace about where content marketing starts and ends versus link building. And link building is an aspect of SEO, but content marketing, I think, is broader than that. But link building is kind of like a specialized use case, I think, of content marketing where you're trying to get linkable assets out there, not necessarily on social media because those are no follow no followed links, but on other people's blogs and websites that have a followed link back to your site. Yeah. And I would view that more of like a goals situation. So if your goal is like SEO and like reaching out to these people and be like, my blog post would be a better link from your blog post. That to me is an entirely different goal and goal set than content marketing, where you're actually trying to build an audience of people who like what you have to say. Yeah, got it. And and what do you think is the gold standard in terms of content marketing? Who's doing top-notch, top-shelf content marketing? And could you give a few examples of 
their campaigns. Yeah. So, I mean, so it comes in different flavors. So my specific flavor of content marketing is for, for online coaches. And so, uh, that's online personality brands where you're putting yourself out there and people are connecting with you as like a real person. Now there's a ton of really great examples of companies and other people doing content marketing, but really anybody that you're going to follow on Instagram or on YouTube and be like, yeah, I can't wait for their next video to come out or what's their next story on Instagram. Those are all really great uh, content marketing examples. So even like, you know, your greats like Amy Porterfield does great content marketing. And there's a ton of people over on YouTube that does really like any YouTube channel that has a subscribership in little niche, niche little topics that you like are a great example of doing content marketing. So you can go follow mine at, can I give my Instagram handle at the dot Lindsay dot Anderson. I love content marketing. Um, and, uh, and it's really where I get all of my customers. Right. And why Instagram and not YouTube? I'm, I'm assuming that you're also on YouTube, but you, your go-to was Instagram. Hey, check out my content marketing on Instagram. So what is it about Instagram that you love as a platform? Yeah. So my personal methodology, which I call the, the content that converts dot me methodology uses YouTube and Instagram and email marketing all three together as like the perfect mix of, of bringing people into your world. And so let me explain how I utilize each of the three platforms. So let's start with YouTube. YouTube, I view, and this is how I coach, is basically where people are going to go to understand your methodology and your experience and your skill set. So out on YouTube, you're going to have videos that are like that are like how to do content marketing, how to uh, do a story on Instagram, how like answering questions, how to mindset questions, and they're like nice little seven to ten minute videos over on YouTube where people can go and see my methodology and my skills at work out there on YouTube. Now, a piece of the reason why people come to you as a personality is they want to like know, like, and trust you. They want to like understand your vibe and how you work. A very small piece of people working with you actually has to do with you knowing the very most out of anyone to do the thing. Like part of it is that people want to work with somebody they like to work with. And so that's why on my YouTube videos, I will seed my Instagram and I'll be like, Hey, I'm doing, I'll show you the back end of my coaching business all day long on Instagram and over on Instagram, they're going to be able to pick up on my vibe. They're going to learn more about me, my belief systems, uh, how I run my business, my personality, my family, a few little business, personal pieces of content over on Instagram. That's more like, more like laid back and behind the scenes than YouTube. And so Instagram, I like so much because it's during the day. I can just show background info. I can give little tips. Maybe I have a, a one-on-one -on -one session with a customer. So I'll hop on a story and be like, oh my gosh, just had this one-on-one -on -one session with a client. And they said like they were really struggling with pricing. And so this is kind of what I said. And I can teach little lessons, but it's more like at my desk, behind the scenes, laid back, people can pick up my vibe. And the reason why I really like Instagram is because of the DM feature and the ability to connect with our audience there on Instagram more than even YouTube because of the DM feature, as well as stories. Stories are these 24 hour short little things that disappear after 24 hours. They're supposed to be like, just here you go. If you want to, it's like when someone calls you up and is like, Hey, what you doing today? Like that's the answer to stories is Go look at my stories. That's what I'm doing today. And it brings a level of closeness and a level of, of connectedness with our audience that improves the sales process and helps us build our audience and, and our relationships. And so on Instagram, I will, of course, mention my YouTube. On YouTube, I'll, of course, mention my Instagram because they're going to get two different kinds of things there. And then, of course, we can never trust the social media algorithms to deliver our message to our audience. So we have to pull them off and get them on our email list so that we have control over our messages and how people see them. So I utilize those three platforms in a very powerful way to build an audience and sell more programs. That's awesome. And when you're uh, doing YouTube specific uh, content marketing, are you mm -hmm. utilizing the community tab as well, or you're just posting videos um, like the traditional YouTube videos? Yeah, I'm posting uh, right now on YouTube. I'll do, I'll post a lot of videos. I utilize the, the tool. It's a pretty popular tool called 
uh, TubeBuddy. So that will tell me what kind of topics people are searching for on YouTube. Like it's very, it's a great tool. It'll tell you like what videos to pretty much go after based on how many, how much competition you have, how many keyword searches you are, and if you even have a chance of ranking. And so I'll find my YouTube videos over there. And then I will do a live stream once a week because I find that like a live stream once a week for any business is actually just like, it will help you build that re reciprocity and that, that intimate relationship with your online audience. Yeah. One thing about live streams on YouTube that I don't like personally is that if I want visitors or you know, watch time on the live stream recording after the fact, the YouTube algorithm just does not give much love to those recorded live streams. Whereas if it's a traditionally uploaded video uh, to YouTube, you have a much bigger shot at um, showing up as a suggested video in the recommendation engine and in terms of SEO and YouTube showing up in the YouTube search results. So I'm curious. Yeah, I where... would agree with that. And may... do you mm -hmm. think that has to do with like, like, I don't really like to watch past live streams. I would much rather watch like this video that was created like for me to watch right now. Like a live stream to me is only exciting when it's live, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's how most people are. And that's why the algorithm does not favor those uh, videos unless it's live at the moment. If you do a search inside of YouTube, you will find that uh, there are some live streamed videos showing up high in the search results, but they are taking place at the moment. Once the live stream is finished, oh. yeah, they're buried. Now, tell me what you know about this, which is, which is, you know, on the social media platforms, they like you to utilize like all their, their latest, greatest, like tech, right? Like their latest, greatest features. And so do you have any idea on if it will help you promote your channel in general, like your other videos, if you do take the time to live stream on YouTube? Do you know that? Um, I don't, uh, because I don't really do live streaming on YouTube. If I live stream, it'll be on Facebook or Instagram. And even then, I don't do it that much. I don't know. I just, I'm not really that into live streaming. I should do more of it, but. Uh, oh, we all have our to do's, right? Yeah. <laughs> our content marketing to do's. Yeah, but I do think Instagram Live, out of, out of all the live streaming platforms, is probably the, the, the most beneficial, especially if you're going to get other people on the live stream with you, like uh, uh, a guest that you're interviewing because mm -hmm. their audience will also be notified that you have that that person has gone live so inside of the instagram app all those uh fans and followers of uh your guest will get notified that the two of you are currently live on instagram so that is a way to reach another audience whereas you don't get that benefit with all the other social platforms Super smart. Yeah, agreed. I do like that little she's live notification situation over on Instagram. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 So you mentioned TubeBuddy. I use that too. Um, are you doing TubeBuddy uh, A-B split tests where you can split test the uh, uh, the titles and the, the uh, image thumbnails? You know, I, I am not but that sounds amazing right now. It's like, there's so much content that gets like a hundred percent for that. I want to create, first of all, the content I want to create is showing up pretty good on you on tube buddy. So it's more like I'm focused on creating those videos to meet, to meet the demand of TubeBuddy buddy right now. Yeah. Now, how do you create the videos? Are you using uh, special equipment to shoot the, the videos? Are you just using your iPhone? Are you, uh, doing it in a studio? Do you use a videographer? And then for the editing, are you using a video editor person? You're doing it yourself? You uh, outsourcing it on Upwork or something like that? Like walk us through your process for uh, coming up with the video ideas, then shooting and then editing and, and then publishing. Yeah, sure. So, so the way that I do it is, or I have found this about myself, and I think a lot of people can relate, which is the harder that we make creating content and videos, the less likely I'm going to do it. So if I'm going to require like this huge setup situation and whatever, even if I want to time block and do it once a month or something, like it just seems like 
very, very difficult. And I have to write the scripts and stuff like that. For me, um, I would much, I have my equipment set up here. So I have my DSLR camera set up here. I got a ring light here and I got some soundproofing going on and a good mic. So for me, and this is what I teach in my courses is you got three, three factors in a good YouTube video and, and, and the quality or the quality of them go like this. So the first thing that you cannot skimp on is audio. If your audio is bad, people are out of there. Like they'll forgive you for a lot of other stuff, but bad audio, it's not going to work. So you do have to invest in some sort of decent mic. You cannot use your laptop mic or even your phone mic. Cannot happen. Would you agree? I agree. And I, I have to tell you, before we started recording, I could see that you were using a Shure uh, microphone and, uh, you know, props for that. I was uh, relieved because some of the audio, uh, yeah, audio recordings were not fabulous in, uh, in, in the recent uh, few weeks of some, some of my guests, even though it's in, it's in the uh, instructions for the, the, the booking form. Make sure you doing uh, uh, you know high quality audio. Yeah, a lot of people will show up just with uh, nothing. You know, the iPhone. Yeah, and that and sucks it. for you as a host because you're like, this is my podcast, peeps. Come on, yeah, <laughs> like they won't forgive you for it. You know, yeah. <laughs> they'll leave if it's crappy audio. So that's one thing you can't. You know, you can get a little like this is uh, you know my mics you know, you like you work your way up, but you've got to start, you've got to get some sort of external mic going on for both your phone and your computer, no matter what. Yep, so the second, I would say that you can't, the second most important is going to be video. And so the good thing is every cell phone now, like you have a higher level cell phone, that's going to have a good enough video quality for you to pull, pull something off. So, so get yourself a tripod and you can totally record it on your video. I use my DSLR camera. I'm not using it right now. But um, I use a DSL camera because that gives you depth of field, which I'm madly in love with. And I think it improves the video quality like by 10. Like people are like, she's a professional because her background's fuzzy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I'm, <laughs> I'm currently using a Logitech uh, Brio uh, webcam for, for the podcast interviews. But I am planning on getting a, like a Sony a5100 or something like that and uh yeah having the depth of field settings so that everything's fuzzy in 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 the background just subtly you know not like uh not like one of those effects where it's a blur option a little tick box and 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 zoom or skype or something i don't like that i think that looks cheesy and yeah, like that looks super lame. Something. I'm talking about a nice camera with a very shallow, yeah, like a little depth of field, like, oh, that's, you know, that's high quality. Just like, that's high quality, you know, a little cinematic there. Yeah, yeah. And but then certainly you need a special necessary. connection in order to hook up that DSLR to your your computer, to the USB port. So uh, what are you using, like Cam Link or something like that? I use, uh, you know what, uh, like I said, th and you're right, like it's, it wasn't fun to set up. You know what I mean? Like you have to have a little piece of software and you have to have this little external thing. Honestly, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. Like I got it done and I'm like, see you later. It works, you know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> like tech, text, like the hardcore text, not my, not my favorite thing to figure out and remember. So, yeah. but, yeah, he's, but you're link. absolutely right. <laughs> so that, yeah. that'll be something I'll include a link to in the show notes, along with all this other cool stuff that we're talking about, things like uh, TubeBuddy and uh, the, what, what depth of field is and all that. We'll, we'll link all that in the show notes. Um, I'm, I'm curious, do you have an example favorite YouTuber th that you uh, recommend we include in the show notes as, as a best practice example? I know you mentioned Amy Porterfield. She... Amy Porterfield's not on YouTube, I don't think. I don't think. I mean, Sunny Lanarduski is great on YouTube. Um, if you, you know, if she you was a know her. past guest and the thing here is, on, on this. Oh, she show. was. Yeah, yeah, she's really awesome. Um, and she, so she's she's one. And you know, my specialty is certainly like this business personal kind of content. Like, you know, like you're getting your message out, your methodologies out, and you're trying to get customers business personal. Like I'm not, I'm not like, um, documenting my life here. Like it is business, but you do have to put a little personal. So like, that's my, that's my specialty on YouTube. And so me sitting at my desk, turning on a camera, I have something I want to share. It works for TubeBuddy. Then I can like hit record and create a good video and upload it. 
you know, yeah. as I'm feeling if that's just how my personal creative process works. But I have one more thing to cover, which is on quality. So you got audio, you got video next or, or videos next and then lighting. But I would actually say lighting is second most important. Right. And so get yourself a ring light. Like unless you're going to, unless you don't live in Portland, Oregon, like I do. Um, and it's always sunny, I guess you could face a window, but like, because human skin looks best in the sun. And so unless you want to face a window, which you don't, because again, you don't want to be scheduling your YouTube content around when the sun shines, you just got to get yourself a high quality ring light so that you always have good white light on your, on your face. You just got to do it. Yep. And do you have a particular ring light you recommend? I do not. Okay. I do not. I just have, All right. I have, yeah, se- we'll I have like several hop on you, around Amazon the house. Amazon then. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, search for <laughs> ring light. Okay. Awesome. I did, I'm sorry. I did not come prepared for all of these awesome questions. <laughs> I'm more like, get it done and move on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's uh, if, if it's not our listener's specialty, they could just hire somebody to set up their, their, their setup. Like I didn't know what lighting uh, kit to get. So I had a, an expert in that area just dropped me a, an Amazon link uh, for a particular lighting set, which I'm not using at the moment, but it's not just a ring light. It, it has uh, four different lights with, uh, uh, you can change the settings on the warmth of the lighting and stuff like that. It's, it's very, yeah. And you can go down a serious rabbit hole in the way that, you know, that I've worked, obviously it's like this ladder. Like I got, you know, I started with a blue Yeti, which is like a hundred bucks. And then you get the sure mic, which is like 500 bucks, you know, and same goes for camera, same goes for lighting. Like you can create good business, personal content on YouTube and you don't have to have all this expensive stuff, but you do need like a certain level. Like you gotta, you gotta invest a little bit. So you come across as professional. Yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of professional or business personal, I would love to share something that I learned from Taki Moore and get your take on it. Um, He describes this, that you want to flip the script on what normally people expect to see is on, uh, let's say, LinkedIn, you're more professional with the the folks on, on LinkedIn or, you know, pretty much all business all the time. It's not, not super personal on Facebook. It's more personal, way more personal. So what he suggests is you flip the script on that. You, you be more personal on the business platforms like LinkedIn, and you be more businessy on the personal platforms like Facebook. And that differentiates you, separates you from everyone else who's doing the same thing. And I do like that, that, that approach. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on it. Yeah. So I would say, so I am more coming from, I want to use my, I want to, I want to make my content accessible on all platforms. I don't want to be recreating content for Facebook or for LinkedIn. So the best way that I have found Again, I keep using this business personal content because I think it works on all the platforms. So let me give you an example of what it would look like. So typically, like let's say, let's say, um, hold on, let me come up with a quick example. Uh, So let's say uh, one of my specialties is helping people launch, perform launches, some sort of challenge. You open a cart, you make a crap ton of money, and then you close the cart kind of situation selling coaching programs. So that's one of my specialty is launches. And so instead of, taking a LinkedIn and being like, you know, when you go into a launch, a launch mindset trick, uh, sometimes, you know, my customers get real, you know, it's, it's hard to maintain the momentum in a launch and you feel really self-conscious. And before that cart closes, it can be really tough. So you, you know, you gotta get a go get them attitude and stick with it. So that might be something that's really, it feels really uptight. It feels like I'm talking at my audience instead of with them. So when I say business personal content, this is really more accessible to every, all the social media audiences, which would look like this. Yeah, I'm in the middle of a launch and I realized that 
the hardest part about a launch is like the last two days because there, you got your initial sales and then I'm right here in the last two days and no sales are coming in today and I'm getting in my own head about, oh my gosh, am I actually going to be able to break my goal for my launch? And that can be really, really stressful. This is something that I share with my clients, blah, 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 blah. And then I give the lesson. So when we bring in storytelling and we bring in our own experience, instead of talking at our audience, we talk with our audience and we share just a little bit of vulnerability about ourselves and what we've been through and our story. And we come down to our clients, to where they are, our prospects. Like, I'm just like you. I'm just a human like you. And we share just a little bit of vulnerability. It becomes so much more accessible on all the social media platforms. It's extremely accessible on LinkedIn. It's very accessible everywhere. And so that's how I approach content. I don't want to create two kinds of content, one for Facebook and one for LinkedIn. I throw a message like that on all the platforms and I call it good for the day. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? It totally does. And I noticed, yeah. I noticed yeah. on Reddit, I don't know if you have any Reddit users here, but I like Reddit quite a bit. That's what, that's my personal yeah, go-to social media platform, but they've been feeding me uh, ads for LinkedIn and the ad says exactly what I just said, which is I uploaded a personal picture on LinkedIn instead of having it all buttoned up. Like this is the ad that LinkedIn is, showing me because this approachable, I am a human. I'm not just all business all the time. Like people are just not responding to that anymore. And you've got to come down to where your customers are and be like, I am a human too, because people do business with humans. Not like, like I said, if they were looking for the best there is, chances are, you know, they would go to Tony Robbins or something like that, or what, whoever the super best in your industry is. They won't. They come to you because of your vibe, your experience, your skills, and your methodologies and the way that you put that message out there in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. One of my favorite examples of storytelling and uh, I think business, I think it's business personal, but I didn't really um, put that label on it before. And it, I think it, I made up that label. Yeah, you heard I, it right here, guys. You heard it right here. <laughs> awesome. Well, do you know who Casey Neistat is? It's a big YouTuber. Yes. Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah. So yes. do what you can't is m one of my favorite videos on YouTube. It's so inspiring. It's great storytelling. It's great videography, great editing. It's, it's really top, top shelf. And that, and that has been his featured video for a while on his channel. I don't know if it currently is, but uh, I'll include the, uh, the video in the show notes for, for this episode so that our, our listener can, can watch that. But it is awesome. And I don't know if you are familiar with that video. I'm not. I'm going to totally go check that out. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's inspiring. It's fun. So anyways, I'm curious. Do you have uh, an example great storytelling video that you want to share? It could be yours. It could be a client's. It I mean, just be... go check out my channel. So lindsay.tube is a direct link to my YouTube channel, which that's a ninja trick, by the way. If you want to grow your YouTube channel, if you're on Instagram and you're doing a story and you're like, hey, I just released a YouTube video, go check it out. Like Instagram, we all know, hates links. They only put links in. Nobody likes links, blah, 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 right? So no one's going to go to YouTube and like search for your channel. Like that's just not going to happen. It's too much effort. So I always recommend to my students, uh, go buy a vanity URL, lindsay.tube. So anytime I mention my YouTube channel, I say, go to lindsay.tube. It's easy enough, redirect, done. So all of my videos out there are storytelling. They come from a, a, a personal experience because I have found that those are just like, those are people resonate with those. I can teach lessons through those. That's how I learned. What I learned is through the stories that I tell. So documenting, understanding your own stories and laying it out like that, coming down to your clients instead of talking at them makes for really great YouTube videos. Yeah. I, I love that tip of uh, having a, a vanity domain. I have a bunch of those myself. Like for example, instead of giving out a URL it has zoom.us slash J slash blah, blah, blah. I just tell people to go to zoom with stefan.com. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yep. yep. And I also have talk to stefan.com to book on my calendar. And uh, yeah, I just have a whole bunch of these different 
uh, domains. The trick is remembering them, eh, Stefan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what was that Zoom link that I set up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. And and sometimes if your name begins with uh, a vowel, you might not want to have talk to, uh, you know, like my wife's name is Orion. So talk to Orion has two O's uh, together. That's not ideal. So for her, it's speakwithorion.com. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, those Anyways. vanity URLs are pretty useful. I like the one for YouTube all day long because, you know, it's real easy just to mention. Like, go see the my latest on lindsay.tube. Yeah, that so. is great. That is great. And are .tube domains much more expensive than .coms or pretty much the No, same? that one ran, I think that's eight bucks a year, man. And it doesn't have to be .tube, obviously, you know. It can yeah. be whatever Although you guys want nice. it to it's pretty nice. I didn't even think about getting a .tube. I'll Boom. do that now. There you go. <laughs> guys, I just taught Stefan something. Gave him uh, an idea. Yes, <laughs> I always learn stuff on these interviews. Thank you for that. Okay. So what about Facebook? Because we talked about YouTube. We talked about Instagram and email. That's kind of a one, two, three punch. But what about Facebook. Is what that, about that, Facebook yeah. these days? What yeah. a what a what a what a lovely social media platform that has turned out to be. So <laughs> I'm a little na- so I mean it's a bit of a mess, right? Like I mean I'm uh, you know my attitude comes from uh just the mess that is the iOS update as of March of 20 20- 2021 and just like ads were working and now like Apple came out and was like, "Yeah, great. Facebook we know you love to track, but you're just not going to track anyone on our devices unless they give you explicit permission, which like nobody is. So the ads game over there kind of blew up. And so I have a negative attitude. Plus, it's very, very difficult to get organic reach over on Facebook. You can get much more organic reach on Instagram and YouTube. But this is how I ha- this is my view on Facebook, my personal view on Facebook. So one of my best selling courses is called uh, Facebook group secrets where um, you can build a really strong and amazing audience out there in Facebook. Um, and I believe my personal view on Facebook is that it's most mostly about groups. Facebook likes groups. They want you to build groups. You can get reach in groups. And so building your audience and a group out there on Facebook, highly recommend, very, very powerful. Um, but but as far as like organic reach and like using your page, like it's just not going to work unless you put some money behind it. So when you're, I mentioned repurposing content, of course, Instagram and Facebook are the same company. Anytime I post on Instagram, I just go ahead and allow it to post on Facebook. Heck, why not? Okay. And then I nurture groups. I have a group out there for online coaches. And so that's where, like, that's what I use Facebook for primarily is for groups. Now you can utilize your personal your personal um, profile on Facebook. It's against the terms of service to like do a ton of business out there, but you can get like a, like a smidgen of reach out there on your personal profile. So once a week or something, I'll take my best post and throw it on my personal profile. But besides that, that's kind of where I'm at with Facebook. What do you, what do you think? I mean, is that where you're at? Yeah, it's pretty much just uh, pay to play. And yeah, uh, so I do run some Facebook ads or I, I have a Facebook ads person doing that for me. But um, what, what about reels? Uh, are you? Oh, man, reels? reels are everything. They are everything. Um, because Instagram, you know, I was just teaching a class on this. Instagram just came out the last week and was like, you know, they have a, they have a content creators fund. Like they really want you to do real. So is the way that I view it is like they saw TikTok take the world on fire and TikTok's like, oh, we know how the human brain works. They like really short videos and like everyone watches TikTok. They're extremely addicted to TikTok and Instagram's like, oh yeah, we need that. So they basically lifted it and they're like, okay, we need to do that because the addictive human brain psychology, right? It's like drugs reels. And so to Instagram like just wants you to do reels, they're going to pay you to do reels. You do a reel right now and and people will and like you'll get thousands and thousands of people reach where organically on a post you're going to get like a 100. So uh, Instagram's going to like like you're going to be currying favor in the Instagram algorithm if you do reels. So reels are are where it's at if you want to grow your Instagram account. Yeah, are you doing reels? 
I am doing reels. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Are you also Gotta posting do it. Gotta to do TikTok? It. So I'm trying to figure, so that's the thing, right? You cannot, so you're going to get, you're going to get your hand, you're not going to get as much reach. You can't like reuse the same reel on TikTok and Instagram because like, the algorithms are both like, hey, we know that's not original content, so we're not going to show you to a bunch of people. So you got to figure out a way to like to get the most reach out of them to like make the same reel on TikTok and make the same reel on Instagram. But you got you can like you can't you can't use the same exact content. You got to like do it twice or like create a video and upload it in both places. Like you've got to figure out a way to utilize that twice. And sometimes like the sound effects aren't as popular on TikTok and you can't find the same sounds as you can on Instagram. So for me right now, where my client base is, they're on Instagram. Do I need to be on TikTok? Am I messing around with TikTok in my process? Yeah, but I don't have it quite nailed in yet. And I just really want to focus on one social media platform at a at a time. And that is Instagram at this point. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm not on TikTok and, uh, I'm concerned also about the, uh, the government overreach in, in China. So yeah, I don't, I don't have it on my phone installed or anything. Yeah. I, it's addictive. I, I don't spend a ton of time there, but like, I mean, it, you can get a lot of reach on, you can drive a lot of traffic on TikTok. But like I said, I'm a, I'm an Instagram reels kind of girl at this point. Yeah. What about clubhouse? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> are you on clubhouse? <laughs> well, I, yeah, technically, but I don't think I've logged in for about five months. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I like, you know, a Periscope and like, you know, we've seen them all come and go, all of these, all these, you know, social media platforms. So my take is I'm not on Clubhouse. I focus on the ones I need to focus on. The thing is you can find success on any social media platform. To me, it's personal. It's like, what kind of content do I like to create and what kind of content can I, can I handle being consistent with? Cause it's all about consistency, you know, and creativity and leaning into your message. And so like, if that is hosting clubhouse rooms and you can do that and like, that's what you drive with, please go on clubhouse, drive some traffic there. Um, it's not for me. I don't know a lot about it. It's not the way that I like to do my content. So um, that's what I think about Clubhouse. I think it's great for people who like to do it as long as you can freaking stay consistent, but like, don't put it on your list because you feel like you have to, you yeah. know? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, you mentioned Reddit as a platform that you really enjoy. Is that one where you're marketing, doing content marketing? No, on? it's a per that's like, that's like drinking the cup, cup of coffee where I spend my time. Like I, ironically, I, I love, so like, I like social media from from like a business standpoint, but like from a personal standpoint, I mean, I, w I hate to even tell anyone this. I wouldn't be on any of the social media channels if I didn't work here. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I like Reddit because it's like, you know, you can read what people are saying, but you're not like hooked to them as like a person. Like it's just more like general info and commentary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the notifications with some of these social platforms are, are really invasive and overreaching and uh, addicting, created yeah. and, and optimized to be super addicting. So I've turned off all notifications on my phone for all social platforms. Uh, yeah, in fact, everything. I'm with you because it can take your whole day down. It can take your mindset down. Like it's not good for time blocking. It's not good for getting stuff done. It's not good for your mind. Like for me, it's very like compartmentalized for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And how about Pinterest? Are you a fan of Pinterest? I am a fan of Pinterest, honestly, for personality brands, at least the kind of personality brands that I deal with. Um, like I use that more from an SEO perspective because you can actually drive, you make some, you may as well like reuse your nice graphics from a blog post or a YouTube video to drive traffic. But like, as far as like me loving it and spending a lot of time curating content over there, I don't, I have a VA duplicate so we can drive some traffic. That's my personal mm -hmm. Pinterest strategy. Okay. Which platform are you strongest on in terms of your reach, your followers and uh, impressions and engagement metrics? I would say Instagram, Instagram, but honestly, like my, 
it, it used to be YouTube or it used to be Facebook. Like I was really big on Facebook. Then I had to go to Instagram because Facebook rot, uh, dropped. Honestly, I would give it all up for my email list. Honestly, like if you guys haven't started an email list, it's everything because it doesn't matter if Instagram dies tomorrow, you have access to your audience via your email. And it doesn't even have to be that hard. If you're creating content, like literally, if you're creating content on YouTube and email once a week with your late, like a little cool thing about your YouTube video, like is what it takes. And then when you're in a sales cycle, you have people to talk to. Yeah. And having a small, highly engaged email list is way more valuable than having a very large uh, disengaged email list. Yes. And that's why I say you've got to email them once a week. Like, I don't care if you have 15,000 people on your email list, if they've never heard from you and like the bit, like they don't feel like they know, like, and trust you, it's worthless. So you've got to email them once a week. Yeah. Minimum. What's your, what's your newsletter like, or your regular, uh, email blast? Yeah, so my regular email blast goes out every Monday. You guys can get on it by going to crew.lindsay.tube. See what I did there? Huh? Huh? Okay. <laughs> so so I release my YouTube video every Monday. And so it will be like, hey, today I released a video and it and and it's a personal message. It's not like, here's the video. It's like like you gotta you gotta bring it personal and do some conversational copywriting. Don't get into your head about like not using jargon and being like too buttoned up, like sit down and write an email to your audience about your YouTube video. I created this YouTube video because my customer came to me and they were crying. And this was the message I told them to get them to dry their tears. Go check it out on YouTube. Boom. Also this week, I introduced my brand new cat over on Instagram. You should totally go see little Mew Mew over there. This is not true at all. I don't even have a cat. Okay. And I would not name it little Mew Mew, but go see little Mew Mew over there. Uh, if you want to see this beautiful little kitty that came into my house, uh, PS I'm hosting a free workshop on content that converts.me. If you want to learn how to make engaging content for your online business, go here, sign up, boom, send. Awesome. So you just like, again, it's just like recreating it, but you're sending it out on email. And like, you know, if you're in your head, you're like, but they saw that on Instagram, the exact same thing. Like they didn't because you can't count on the algorithms to serve that up to people, you know? So you have to just serve it back up in email. Yeah. And then when it comes time for a sales cycle, dude, you can just fire emails and make sales all day long. Yep. Are you familiar with uh, Dean Jackson's nine word email? I sure, I'm a big fan of that nine word email, man. Huge yeah. fan. <laughs> so yeah, very do effective. you want me to explain what that is or have you already Please. covered it on the podcast? <laughs> um, many of our listeners won't, uh, won't know about it. So yeah, please go ahead. Like if you guys have a dead email list or like if you have some sort of email engagement or if you're sitting over there being like, hmm, no one on my email list responds, here's the ninja tactic is, is this nine word email. So in the subject line, you put first name, dot, dot, dot. Okay. And then in the body of the email, you say, Hey, first name, are you still interested in learning and knowing more about whatever? Okay. Whatever it is that you teach. And then you take the footer of your email, like all the, the thing that says I'm an email marketing email and you push it down. You do tons of enters. Okay. And then you send that out. People will think you're personally emailing them you'll respond to them. Like people will respond to you. Like we'll get people responding to that. Yes, I am. Or no, I'm not. Or whatever the case may be. Um, but it looks like a personal email from your desk. Yep. And how often Is that do you how you send understood a, the nine word email? Yeah, that's great. I mean, you, you can send really anything, any kind of offer or shake the trees kind of email in, in nine plus or minus uh, two or three word emails. And a uh, great example, I've got one here from Taki Moore. He, he sends a lot of these out. The first, I fell for a nine word email. And since then, like I replied to the guy, I was like, yeah, I am still interested. And I was like, oh my gosh, that guy just nine word emailed me. And I totally <laughs> fell for it. And I knew about it. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. So here's an example uh, just received a week or so ago from Taki. Would you like to sign clients by Christmas? <laughs> talking <laughs> yeah and then you scroll 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 and there finally is the uh if you wish to stop receiving our emails or change your subscription options please manage your subscription <laughs> that's the key guys you gotta make it look like it came from me to you again it's this personal thing that we keep talking about today like 
you know, you're not an email marketer. You you have to come down to where your client, your audience is. You're a person to person, guys, a person to person. Yeah. Good stuff. Now, uh, your email list is uh, what? How how big? Or you don't have to share, but uh, if- yeah, we got. I have fifteen fifteen thousand people on that email list. Although we're currently going through uh, hygiene right now, so. Okay. You know, you got to do that. So we're sending out groups of 100. Hey, you haven't opened for a while. We're going to kick you off. You got to take some action. And so we'll probably clean a good 5K off of that because we we do that every couple of years. I should do it more often, but it's time. So that means you're going to go down to maybe 10,000. And does that have a net positive impact on your sales? Uh, Does it have a kind of a neutral effect or... Is it actually detrimental because that's less reach? Well, they weren't even opening my emails, right? And then you're delivering. So the email providers are getting signals about your list. So if you're sending out to a bunch of people and they're not opening it, then they're going to, it's going to send more signals that, hey, I should send this over to spam. This is worthless, that kind of thing. So really, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, which is quality all day long. So if these people aren't opening my email, See you later. You weren't going to buy my stuff anyway. Yeah. Although there are plenty of people who are privacy advocates and they will turn off image loading by default, including the web bugs, so that the email service and thus the client of the email service has no idea if the email was opened. I I do that. I I rarely hit the button that says load images. If I can um, ascertain what the content is, Without loading the images, especially if I'm on my phone, I just don't load the images. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So you might be cleansing some people who are actually consuming your content from your emails. Uh, that's the, the only The email cleaning we are doing or making them, we're like, you got to click here if you want to stay kind of situation. So yeah. I guess that's a, that, that's a good point. Yeah. If, uh, if they are reading your emails, they would see that and then uh, they would care enough to to opt back in. Um, I send an email every Thursday. Mine's called Thursday three. And it's one thing that um, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued by one thing that I'm you know, concerned by and, and, and one that is, uh, you know, so, so intriguing, surprising and challenging or something like that. And I don't actually write those myself. A little secret there I'm sharing with uh, my listeners right now. Even though it looks like I've written them, I have not. In fact, I don't even review them anymore. So I have no idea. That's nice. That's 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 a a great way to, to figure out your system, man. Yeah. Yeah. The way Do you also send out the podcast link in one or is that different? The podcast goes out in the Thursday three, but it's not one of the three things. The three things, which actually are curated by me, because I use something called Pocket, and it's a bookmarking uh, service where if I see something that I personally want to capture, or I think it's going to be good content for my uh, my my peeps, I will add it to pocket and then my team has my account login for pocket and they go in and they pull from it and formulate the three things for thursday three based on stuff that i'm putting into pocket so it works really well i don't have the time to review uh, blog posts that are ghost written for me so my team is doing that like i just want to be out of the loop i don't want to be a bottleneck I don't know what the blog posts are that are being posted as me uh, on stephanspencer.com. No idea. I I don't know what I'm tweeting out. I have 120, 130,000 people on uh, followers on Twitter. I have no idea what I'm blasting out to them multiple times a day because I don't write any of it. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, well, I got to scale myself and uh, I can't do it. It's the opposite. If I'm uh, wanting to ramp up my content marketing and thus have more posts per day and then I have to review it or write it. Yeah, that mm-hmm. doesn't work. Impossible. Impossible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, where is Twitter fit for you in in your content marketing priority list? Yeah, I don't use I guess my personal view on Twitter is like it would be when I when I was using it and the way that I understand the best use out of it is going to be that you're out there having conversations, you're retweeting, you're having conversations. It's not something I'm interested in or have a passion in, so I just kind of leave my Twitter out of it, honestly. Like I've tried to put just like here's my latest content, blast blast blast. I guess I just don't I don't see a lot of valuable traffic from there, anything like that. So I don't include Twitter because I don't want to spend the time out there. Yeah. Awesome. So why is it called crew.lindsay.tube instead of, um, you know, something even shorter <laughs> with only the domain and that, and no subdomain? Well, like lindsay.tube, I already own that domain. Right. And then just yeah. to get on the general email list and we have a lot of like, like we have a lot of um, social events. So I'm really big into online social events and like getting people together and hanging out on Zoom and having fun. So like once a month we have the TLC happy hour. And so go, so crew is kind of the name of like my my online following is the crew. And so just crew.lindsay.tube, it reminds them to go to lindsay.tube and just throw in crew in there. It just made sense. Yeah, uh, I, I, should I should figure out a short domain for getting people onto my email list. For now, I'll just say go to stephanspencer.com and click the, the subscribe button. But yeah, that's not as elegant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, these marketing domains, again, you have to remember all of them. That's the problem for me. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's talk for just a few more minutes. I know we're we're going to wrap up here shortly, but um, let's talk for a few minutes about launches and challenges, because okay. uh, challenges were all just all the rage last year when it was early on in the pandemic, and now you don't see them that much. Are 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 folks? kind of tired of them now is, is it over you know i hear that a lot and i would i would digress and say that uh there so i've been challenging for four or five years and i still get all of my clients through challenges um and so it might be you know just because we've personally lost interest in them or something it's really easy to be like so you know i just don't see them that much but they are extremely prevalent so a part of my coaching business, well, part of my business is a done for you online agency for coaches. And a big part of those is setting people up for these challenges and launches. And we do those all the time. They're extremely, uh, they're extremely valuable. You can make a crap ton of money. You can build your email list. You build the no like, and trust factor. You, build, you fill cohorts of people. Like it's a, it's a strategy that I think is here to stay. And it's extremely it's extremely valuable. Yeah, okay, for my great. take. And and what's a typical uh, number of uh, registrants for a challenge? And are they paying or are they is it completely free? Great, I, great question. So, um, so that depends on you know. Uh, I always when when newer people who are just like trying to validate their offer and try to figure out what they're going to offer this online world. Obviously, I always recommend to do a challenge and that would be an organic challenge to validate one's offer. And so those challenges are going to be small. You're going to get 50 to 100 registrants. About 20 percent of those people are going to uh, show up for your stuff. And then depending on your sales pitch and your audience and your offer, the high quality of your audience and the quality of your offer. And if like your audience actually wants your offer and you're able to like be like, this is the value I will provide you, um, you can get five to five to 10% of those people to actually sign up for your, for whatever it is that you're selling. Um, and so they can start really small for me, putting the power of paid ads. It's very much how I grow my email list, very much how I get new people into my audience. And so I will personally, our goal is typically to get 500 people into a launch to sell. Um, what was your other question? It was how many people and it was something else. Sorry. Yeah. So if, uh, Oh, paid or not. Yeah. Paid. If people are paying for it. When people pay, they pay attention. And when they're not paying, the likelihood of them attending all, let's say, five days or seven days of the challenge, I would say would be pretty small these days. People are busy. And the you know, early on in the pandemic, there was this novelty factor and, then, and people were working from home and that was new and they were trying to fill their day or they were just laid off. So that is... Um, 
you know, really more for last year than it is uh, these days. So I'm curious uh, uh, about kind of how you, what your permutation is of, of this challenge thing. You're doing them live, you're doing them um, pre-recorded. Are you charging for them or not? And how long are they? Yeah. So I would say anyone starting, just like starting to sell stuff, like doing a paid, doing anything paid, it's going to be pretty steep because they're like, they're not feeling confident. They've never really sold anything. So to even, so I always recommend doing free stuff when you first get started to get your feet wet, to understand your sales process. But once you do that, exactly what you said, you've got to start charging because buyers are listeners and the quality of your email list, the quality of the challenge participants will skyrocket, even if it's $10. Now I usually charge between 37 and $45 for my, for my workshops because you know, buyers are listeners. And so, um, I will always do paid personally and, uh, and yeah, that's just kind of how I handle it is, is that way. And you call it a workshop. You don't call it a challenge. You can call it a challenge. We, we, we permeate, we go through a different, we go challenge, workshop, masterclass, um, just kind of depending on your, your certain flavor and style, like, um, challenge. I feel like, like you said, it feels a little worn out. It also feels like very fitness industry to me. Like we all need to get together and we're challenging goal oriented situation together. But if I'm like teaching content that converts dot me, how to create content online that you actually want to create and converts your customers, that's more of a workshop to me. So it's a three day live workshop. Now I will always do it live. Your conversion rates hundred percent will increase if you are live and not pre-recorded. Got it. And what if somebody doesn't attend all three days? Can you still convert them? Yes, certainly. Yeah. You'll have a bunch of people convert that were just like, that won't like, we'll even just watch the last day, you know, or even read your emails, honestly, but like to get the very most bang for your buck, you want to go live, man. You really do. And I, I used to teach them on Facebook, Facebook live in a Facebook group. And then I did webinars and, and, uh, my conversion rate has increased so much when I am just hosting a zoom meeting, people can see other people. I can see them. We can, we're like meeting, we're like in a space, we're sharing energy. We're, we're there together. My conversion rate, cause I believe that they trust me more. And the no like, and trust factor is increased is when I'm just a regular person on zoom, letting you got throwing down what you guys are picking up. Mm -hmm. So you're doing Facebook, like you're doing Facebook groups though, still, right? Not, not the Facebook. Live. I do have a Facebook group, but I will do all my teaching on zoom because it, yeah. it, um, it converts better. Yeah. Makes sense. And the Facebook group, is that pretty active or I've seen Facebook groups where they're associated with challenges and it's just crickets. Yeah. My Facebook group. Well, I mean, I have a best selling course called group secrets. So yeah, we keep our, I keep my Facebook group very engaged. It's pretty good. The, the secret to keeping a Facebook group engaged is you're not, again, this is my message today. Don't talk at them. We're all here together. And so, and like, you want to have a niche down group. So the topics are always on, are always on like topic. Like we're all like super niche down. Don't just let anyone into your Facebook group. It's quality versus quantity again. And part of it is not just talking about your online business. It's like, you know, I will ask a lot of questions about like people, like what's your favorite book or something like that. So as we get to know people, like people in my community know each other out there. And so, um, like bring yourself down and, and be inclusive and build an audience. Don't talk at them. Mm -hmm. Yep. And how does a launch differ from a challenge or, you know, masterclass slash workshop? Yeah. So my definition of a launch is any kind of sales cycle that has some sort of kickoff, kickoff event, and then an open cart and a closed cart. That to me is a launch. Now there's a, such a thing as an email launch. Like I have an email launch coming up this month for a media placements package that I, that I do. And that's just email. I, uh, basically, uh, we'll get you featured on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. We'll write a story about you, stuff like that. That's just an email launch. I do once a quarter, I send out five emails to my list and we'll make like 20 K off of that. Um, that's an email launch. A challenge is just another kind of launch. You're teaching and you have an open cart and a closed cart. A webinar is another kind of launch. So that's, that's my personal view. I don't think there's like 
anyone, like all of us digital marketers have our own take on all of this, don't we? Hmm. So that's my personal take on it. Like for you to go search for like, what is the definition of a launch? Like, I don't even think you could find consensus here. Yeah. I'd say the closest you could get is Jeff Walker's uh, approach. Look, PLF? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Product launch formula. Cause uh, there's so many people who implement his, his methodology, his methods. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he will teach, you know, I'm sure it would fit into PLF to do a webinar or to do a challenge or to do, you know, an email launch. It's just like this building up of momentum, getting people to, to buy something before you close it down. You know, it's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Last question here. Zoom webinar or Zoom meeting? I do Zoom meeting because yeah. otherwise you're just... Like I said, I like people to share space. I like them to see each other. They don't have to be on camera or anything like that. But like there's a lot of social proof coming as well as like a hundred people being on a freaking Zoom room. Not only that, I can call on. I like to be very engaging and I like to call on people. I like to take questions to me. That makes a work a highly facilitated workshop is way more interested than again me talking at you and you like hoping that you'll listen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't like uh using zoom webinar functionality and i don't like attending zoom webinars where you don't see me on camera as an attendee or if you're the one running the with a webinar you don't get to see who's who's on there in terms of yeah. uh, their video and they don't have access to uh the other participants because they can't see who they are they can't uh, collaborate and and communicate yeah, you may as well be on some live stream somewhere else, you know, yeah. you know, just like your webinar, web, webinar ninja or whatever they're called. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, if, if our uh, listener wants to or viewer wants to go through your masterclass, your your course slash cha uh, challenge, again, that's at content that converts dot me. And how yep, about and go to slash podcast so I can get you a free ticket. Sorry, free tickets at slash podcast. Okay, awesome. So content that converts dot me slash podcast. And that's a for a free ticket to the workshop. And what about your social channels again and your main website? If you could uh, share that again for our, our listeners. Sure. Yeah. So my main my main website's at lindsayacom That's L I N D S E Y A dot com. Uh, catch me on Instagram at the dot Lindsay dot Anderson and then YouTube, YouTube at Lindsay dot tube. Okay. Awesome. And thanks Stefan. This was so fun. So fun. Thank you. You bet. And are you on LinkedIn as well? And what's your LinkedIn? If so, I am, you guys can find me over there too. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Is that LinkedIn? dot com slash Just Lindsay slash Anderson. Lindsay Anderson. Okay. Yeah. We'll include all these yep. in the show yep. notes. So if you're driving or you're lifting weights right now, no worries. Just go to the show notes and all the links will be there. Thank you, Lindsay. This was a lot of fun and enlightening and uh, clearly you know your stuff. So thank you for sharing. And listener, get out there and share your brilliance with your tribe. And we'll catch you on the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.